All right, so uh, you know, if you're just logging in, welcome. Um, as we fill the room, did you get them signed in there? Right now, I'd afford uh, right, some uh, housekeeping things. Okay. Please mute your mics uh, so your background noise doesn't end up uh, coming across to everybody. Um, everyone's video does tax the you know the overall signal because we're going back and forth to one another. So. Um, Feel free to keep your video up, but uh, during the presentation, I'd ask if we could just drop those, drop the video um, on individual feeds. Just turn your video off. At the end of the first presentation, I'm going to ask that everybody turns their video on, and we're going to have Patrick uh, catch a picture of us, and then we'll uh, send it around so that you you'll uh, uh, you know get that whole good, wonderful feeling of being together, which we don't have, and uh, you know you'll you'll. Uh, Take it tonight with you and look at it as you're enjoying a slice of pizza and a beverage because we can't supply that to you today either. So, <laughs> which would be our normal uh, opportunity. So, we got people coming in. Uh, um, it's now 10 o'clock. Um, seems like there's a, a pretty good crowd rolling right now. Um, and yeah, I think we'll just go ahead and kick it off. Patrick, you're there. You're going to mind the store. Patrick Morris, one of my teammates, uh, really put a lot of this together. And, and uh, Patrick, you're going to keep letting people in, right? Okay, great. If you have questions, um, unmute yourself and speak up as we join uh, or as, we, as, we, as I present. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. If you have a question during the presentation, just unmute yourself and interrupt me, it's fine. Um, I will tell you, I can't see you while I'm presenting, and so don't expect me to reply to a, some, you know, to any kind of a hand gesture or whatever. Don't make hand gestures at me, that's what I'm gonna ask. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll get going. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everybody, for coming today. We're gonna start out with a presentation on sugar analysis. Um, so, uh, Darren and Deb are on with GIA, uh, GIA Consulting, started up a lab this last year, and Deb is really running that. Darren and Deb are doing a wonderful job um, processing potatoes right there in their lab, and there are familiar faces to you folks. So you can see them. They've, they have the camera on. They're there today. Um, this is really about an exchange of information, and I was asking Jamie uh, earlier, uh, when the last time we did this remotely like this in 2018, you probably remember I got snowed out of potato days and that can happen. And so we had a format that we used then. And of course, this wonderful pandemic that we're all enjoying at this point in time has given us an opportunity to learn a little more about remote communication. We've all gotten much better at things like uh, virtual meetings than we would ever have cared to be. Uh, it's kind of like one of those diagnostic things that the doctors tell you. Whenever you learn of a medical term, at least whenever I learn of a medical term, I kind of wished I hadn't because I don't know any terms that aren't because someone's suffering something they sh that I wish they weren't. Um, so this may be a something I wish we weren't doing, but uh, I'm thankful that we can at least do this. So uh, this is a discussion that really centers around potatoes, why there is sugar in a potato, what the impacts and types of that sugar are and what we can what we can do about it. So we'll just get right into it. You guys know about Techmark. We've been around um, since 1988. Um, thankfully, got started in Manitoba in 1990, two years after founding the company, we got started in Manitoba. So we've been at it now in Manitoba for a long time and uh, great partnership with, uh, with then Wayne Turner and now Jamie Smart as dealers there, a wonderful support for you folks. Our goals, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we wanna serve high value ag producers, working to make, striving to make the best producers better. So we're gonna talk about two things today. We're gonna talk about both sugar and specific gravity because they work together in the potato, but they aren't always uh, equal in terms of the information they communicate to us as outside growers. So. Here we go, why and how does a plant form a potato in the first place? First of all, the way a potato works, it's got the plant above the ground growing out of the seed piece as you're aware, and it's a factory. The potato is 
uses it machinery called photosynthesis. And you guys know I'm an engineer, so I always like to put uh, equations on the screen. And uh, someone's got a mic open, so if you could close mics, that'd be awesome. Uh, the potato takes six carbon dioxides and six waters, combines them with sunlight through some magic of the plant itself, and creates sugar. That, uh, that C6H12O6, that's actually sucrose. Okay, that's our friend sucrose. And it uses sucrose, or excuse me, creates sucrose and gives off oxygen. That's what photosynthesis is. So, excuse me, glucose, the six carbon sugar glucose combines into two of those, combine into one uh, complex sugar called sucrose. And sucrose is transmitted down the plant and into the tubers to create growth and is converted to starch to create specific gravity. So whenever the plant is harvesting sunlight, it is creating the simple sugar glucose, combining it into the complex sugar sucrose and transmitting it down into and using it also in the plant's respiration growth process. So what is it used for foliar growth can be put down into the tubers. There are a few factors that affect the production of solids, specific gravity and sugar accumulation. First and foremost, the variety we're growing. You grow the varieties you grow because they're suited to do the things you want to do with them. Second is the weather. The weather and the soils in an area, those are the second, third things. Those kind of couple together to say this is an area where you can grow potatoes, Manitoba, okay? If you look at potato centers around the world, there are common weather and soil conditions. Those are the conditions that are regional that put together potato production centers, if you will, around the globe. And then we take the varieties into those centers and we interject our cultural practices. Um, I always put cultural practices in the smallest font, the smallest letters, because if you don't get the first three right, you got no chance. You can cultural practice things to death if you've got the wrong variety. If you've got the wrong soil or the wrong weather, your cultural practices go for naught. However, that is the place where we can fine tune and create profit in the right environment with the right soil and variety. So some variety traits, variety indicates our total yield, our specific gravity, the sugar profile and storage, uh, bruise resistance, disease resistance. I've talked to you about this before, but some varieties are determinate, some are inde indeterminate. Indeterminate variety, Russell Burbank sets continually. Um, so you'll get mature and immature tubers all in the same hill. Uh, determinate varieties tend to have one major set, could have a small second set, but predominantly one major set. The maturity is more consistent. Uh, the processing is more consistent in determinate potatoes. Cultural practices, um, your variety selection and field selection are your top two cultural practices, really. Uh, irrigation, uh, disease control, fertilizer use, those are the things, the levers that you're pulling there on the farm to try and make things go the direction you want them to go. Uh, weather's the wild card in the situation though, and you, you've seen this possibly before, we've talked about it before, but every year is different, and so every crop is different. So treating them exactly the same in storage really isn't probably the best plan because they're different, they need to be treated different. And interestingly enough, within a year, not every crop is the same. And within a farm, not every crop is the same. Um, and within a farm, the variability has got to do with, uh, with soil or other very local events, a heavy local storm or something of this nature. So we come down as we put those factors together, something called crop maturity, potato maturity. It's a key thing that you need to know if you want to succeed in storage. Immature crops, crops that uh, have got uh, the incorrect chemical balance internally, they're not chemically mature tubers. Those crops are tougher to store than crops that are mature. And then an overmature crop, uh, which is one you will probably never face in Manitoba, so I'm not gonna get into too, de too many details about it, but a crop that's had too much wind, too much go, uh, moves into a different set of issues. Um, each of these issues can be compounded when there are stresses added into the equation. Uh, there are some dry land operations uh, in the southern part of Manitoba, so drought can have a big impact on these things. If, a, if you have a pivot that's not performing well, or uh, you know, even if you have some plug nozzles and you've got a band of potatoes that aren't getting irrigated well, 
you're going to see those potatoes uh, that stress compound their uh, their maturity. So two, there's the Cooper sucrose rating. That's the primary indicator of what's called chemical maturity. So <clears throat> historically, people have used specific gravity as a baseline maturity indicator. So you watch the specific gravity of the crop. When the crop has the proper gravity, we know the crop's ready to be harvested, right? That is why we have pre-harvest sampling because that is not the case. It's not true. And we're gonna show data today to support the fact that specific gravity is not the only, matter of fact, sometimes it's not even a real good indicator of maturity. Um, when I look at maturity numbers, and we've done a, a lot, a lot of sampling when it comes to potatoes and maturity, I mean, tens of thousands of samples. And um, gravity is really misleading when it comes to real chemical maturity in potatoes. And that is going to be one of the take homes that I want to make sure we pound in today. And that is that gravity can be very misleading when it comes to the chemical maturity of a potato. I'm going to repeat that a number of times through the presentation. I'm going to show you data to support that statement. Um, so there's a big change we need to make. And that's why we're all together here on this discussion. Talk about juvenile potatoes. Those are really not chemically mature. Like if you were going to look at reproductivity, they couldn't even make a new potato. Okay, that's they're just not mature. They're, the pieces aren't put together. Adolescents have got the correct reproductive pieces. They could grow another potato but they're just not gonna behave well in storage as sometimes adolescents don't. And you know, each one of us probably has someone in our lives who's decided to tell us that we're immature. I get told that often, not real often, but sometimes by uh, people who mean a lot to me and uh, I listen to them when they tell me sometimes. And then there are those chemical mature potatoes that are actually the ones we're hoping to create and grow every single day. So pre-harvest sucrose analysis, how does this play into uh, management of a potato storage. First of all, sucrose analysis in the field lets us get an idea of what the real chemical maturity is of that crop. Uh, then we can look at, you know, fields with similar chemical maturity, can be identified and gotten into storage together. Um, we need to get a, a, an indicator of chemical maturity in the fall prior to any fall harvest or fall stress, okay? So we all know it freezes in the fall. It does that in all good potato producing regions. We'll get a frost in the fall. Um, before that frost, we wanna know where the sucrose level specifically is of this crop. Because the frost is gonna put the potatoes in what's called cold induced sweetening. So that's gonna bring more sugar forward. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but we need to make sure we get a pre-harvest analysis done prior to a frost. So I'm gonna go through some hard data now of uh, information collected here in Manitoba for the 2020 growing season. Uh, 2020 growing season is one that produced uh, variability in terms of maturity. Uh, it was dramatic variability. So if we look at this, we ran 69 pre-harvest samples in the province. Really, I put the glucose on here. Glucose is nothing that we're really looking at in any great deal. But here's our range of sucrose from minimum to maximum. 1484 was the lowest of those 69 samples. 5547, this is huge. This is dramatic, okay? And then these are the gravities that we measured. 1062 is our lowest. We're all gonna assume that the 5447 goes with the 1062, right? And then 1095 was the highest. That must have gone with the 1484. That's the way it works, right? And this is individual samples. The 1484 sample had a 1072 gravity and the 5547 had a 1.08 gravity. Hmm. Not at all what we would have expected. Because we feel that both are indicators of chemical maturity, and this is not true. This is 69 samples of potatoes in this province that show you very clearly that specific gravity is not as good an indicator as sucrose as sucrose is for pre-harvest sampling for maturity. Um, we will process those, but I will tell you a lot of the bumps in the road that you're seeing this year on the process side have to do with how this the environment growing conditions impacted this crop. So we've got variability all over as far as maturity is concerned, and we've got some tremendously good processing potatoes, and we've got some that we're bumping our way along the road with. 
Well, you would tell us. Not as many samples. These next three varieties we don't have as many samples of, but we've got a variance, uh, a lot of immature umatillas. Um, maybe an indicator of why the variety was chasing us around a little bit this year. The high sucrose was an indication with the gravity. Uh, umatilla tend to be a little bit more determinate in terms of the way they perform. Um, so that may help us out with predicting these things. Um, so this is Umatilla. You can't really take that much weight in any of these because there's only eight samples. Same with Rangers, 186 sucrose to 372 for a max. And our gravities of those two samples were actually almost exactly the same. So if we were just using gravity as an indicator, we would think that the 1.86 sample and the 3.72 will act the same in storage. And the reality is that 3.72 sucrose potato is not going to act the same in storage. Now, realize the total number of samples for pre-harvest that we're looking at here is under 100. Now, how many potato fields are there in Manitoba? A lot, right? We didn't sample anywhere near the entirety of this province. Um, this is really an important work. As we've done this work, in different growing regions where we start to ramp up pre-harvest sugar analysis, there are a lot of aha moments for the folks that are trying to operate in that industry in that region. And I just want to encourage you that there are challenges that we're all facing, but there are some aha moments for us as well. So we want to try and get both of those. Uh, clear water is a great looking spot. I mean, you guys know this. Look at your, your you got a pre-harvest sugar of 565, uh, that's just like, these things fry white, you know that. Maybe too white at times, and, and that's up to the processors in the room to determine, but um, really not as high gravity. Um, we did see, uh, you know, a good good mature gravity in, in, in all the samples for clear water. So, and I'm sure those probably, if they're not out of storage yet, they will be, unless somebody needs them longer because they're testing it, but a variety that's got a lot of promise for us going forward. We did the, uh, that's kind of the pre-harvest sugar side, and I'm actually gonna stop the presentation right here, and I'm gonna move back over into this view, and I'm just gonna open up for some questions right now on pre-harvest sugars, because we're gonna move into storage sugar now, and I wanna get the pre-harvest sugar, which I think is a very important starting point for actually starting to understand how sugars work uh, I think it's really important. So are there any questions that, that we'd like to talk about pre-harvest sugars for, let's say, no more than 10 minutes? Todd, Scott here from Simplot. Just curious, when in Manitoba should we start our uh, pre-harvest sugar programs and how many rounds do you recommend we do? Great question, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, the question was, when do we start? Um, sugar profiles and how many rounds should we do. Uh, sugar monitoring really needs to start 21 days prior to harvest and ideally we get three samples 21, 14 and within seven days of harvest. If you can't get those three then at least get the 14 and the seven day or closer. The closer to harvest you get that sample the better. The reason I want to go 21 days out is we never know when that frost is coming Scott. And we want at least two samples prior to frost so we can establish that maturity of the crop before we get to the frost point. Um, so yeah, other questions or comments on pre-harvest sugar sampling? Hey, hey Todd, I know yeah. you're talking about uh, pre-harvest sugars. Um, I guess it's all linked to maturity, but how do we get our potatoes to that point in Manitoba when we're we're always worried about that frost date. It all to do with our management and what do you think? Yeah, it's a great question, John. So the, let, let me just reply to that one to start with. Um, people tell me and, and have told me, I mean, we measure pre-harvest sugars all over the world, guys. They said, well, I can't do anything about this. Why would I measure it? Because we have to know where we're at. Okay, so we're not really determining how we're going to get our potatoes to maturity, we're determining if we did or not. And really our job is from the day we plant that crop to plan for a mature crop in terms of fertilization, in terms of 
uh, disease control, soil selection, the correct variety, those agronomic decisions are really the ones that are going to determine if we're headed for the, for the runway, okay? Like if we're not going to hit the runway when we land, we need to know about that before we land, okay? So that's kind of the way I view this. Like, it, you, you know, on the day that you plant that crop is when the plane takes off and you do your things to that crop as that, you know, as the plane's flying through the sky. And then all of a sudden we're going to try and bring that baby home. We're going to try and land it. And as we're trying to land it, we need to figure out whether or not we're in the glide slope of any of you are pilots. You know, are we coming in too high? Are we coming in too low? Are we too far to the right or too far to the left? We need to hit the runway. If we're not going to hit the runway, the best time to know that is when you got enough time to make a correction. Now, you don't really have much correction, Sheldon, to your point. You can't do a lot to correct it. You have to harvest this crop. But knowing that you're not going to hit the runway, knowing that you're harvesting this crop in an immature state might change, well, not might, it should change the way we manage the storage and the expectations we have for that crop moving into longer term processing. Does that make sense, Sheldon? Yeah, I think so. Um, like this year we did everything possible to make sure that we hit the runway, but you get a bunch of heat in June and you lose the first set of potatoes and uh, that completely changes the, the dynamic of the plant. So it's pretty hard to get back from that uh, mid-season and, and uh, hope that your crop is mature enough to store. These are times where we learn, you know, I mean, the pandemic was one thing in 2020, but the heat in June for the profitability of potato farm was an entirely another one, right? Um, so this is the perfect year to be running pre-harvest sugars. It's, and I, you know, I've talked about that. Um, it's something that we really just need to do as a part of a matter of course, just like you would do anything else in the production process to evaluate, okay, pre-harvest sugars don't tell you anything other than how your agronomy, the weather, the soil, and the variety work together to produce a crop. That's what they're going to do. And it's not going to say, you know, what to change. It's just going to say, did it happen or not? If it didn't happen, you don't put your head in the sand and pretend it did. You need to know it didn't happen. You need to work with the people who are in your usage chain to make sure that crop is going to, everybody understands the potential of the crop and uses it according to its potential. Because there are mature potatoes in this inventory. The trouble is if we can't identify them prior to the inventory's utilization, then we're going to end up having ourselves a challenge at the end, right? If we use all the good stuff up, we're not going to be able to have stuff that's going to work at the end. So it's important for us to do the pre-harvest sugars, to get a feel for where that was, and again, you saw the variability. I mean, we had specific gravities that were acceptable, but sugars were off the charts. So that's telling us that we made it from a gravity point of view to the runway, but we did not make it in all instances to the runway from a sugar point of view. So the way we handle that crop in storage is just going to be different. Uh, one more question, and then we'll move on into the storage part. You should all have received the presentations as well. So this data is in your hands for you to use. If you have not received those, then uh, send an email back to the link that you got this uh, link to join with and the, we'll send the presentation off to you. Any other questions before we move on? Sure, I got one more, Todd. Is uh, excess nitrogen or over applying nitrogen linked to uh, high sucrose, immature potatoes and potentially storage issues? Yeah, great question. The question is whether or not excessive nitrogen has an impact on, uh, on storage issues. And uh, of, of course, the answer to that is it does. Um, we always talk to guys about the difference between yield and sold yield and great sold yield. Um, income is produced on a per hundred weight sold at top grade per acre. Um, it is not per hundred weight. Uh, large hundred weight, large crops that are gonna be processed early uh, are very, very good crops as long as they're making grade. But when you take the extra um, yield and it takes away your grade, you're in trouble. 
Of course, I'm not an agronomist, and so there are tons of people on this call that can do a lot better advising you along those lines. So I can't tell you how much nitrogen to use. I honestly have never uh, used nitrogen or not used nitrogen to produce potatoes commercially because I've never produced them commercially. So you guys all have a big leg up on me on that one. I just watch all your numbers, and when I see that nitrogen number up, I can see an effect on that uh, long-term storability. Okay, well, let's move back into presentation mode then. I believe you're all seeing my screen. We're gonna talk uh, storage um, and storage sugars. So this is a potato storage sugar discussion. So the potatoes make sugar out of their starch to survive. They make that on a cellular level so every cell has to survive. Every cell has to get sugar in order to respire and breathe cell by cell. There's no lungs, no respiratory system, no circulatory system, cell by cell. Okay, and that's how potatoes work. They convert starch to sugar whenever stress is present. So just a simple example, um, cold temperature sweetening. When a potato gets close to freezing, it has been programmed internally to know it's not going to fulfill its mission of reproduction. We all love French fries. We all love chips. We all love eating potatoes. But the bottom line is those potatoes are not there for our consumption. They're there to make more potatoes. Reproduction, that's the reason they're there. So those potatoes need to, need to persevere the cold, right? So the way they do that is by bringing forward sugars. Just like salt or other additives on the road, reduce the freezing temperature of the road so we can keep uh, ice off the roads. Same is true with sugar. Uh, it actually drops the freezing point of the potato to, to cell damage down below uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, that's that's what the potato is making that sugar for in the instance of cold temperature sweetening. So there's a couple of pathways, and this is work that was done in 1988 by uh, Dr. Joe Kinas and uh, Sarge Preston. Um, still get a chance to talk to them a few times a year, which is a, a huge blessing for me. Basically, um, in this pathway that's shown, you see that starch gets moved over into sucrose, and then uh, point C, which is actually where the invertase enzyme sits, um, that can't happen during growth. When the potato is done growing, then we can get the sucrose to glucose formation. This is why we have what I call a harvest hangover. So potatoes frying great out of the field, looks good, put it in storage, all of a sudden things go south. Well, that's because we had too much sucrose in the potato. The invertase enzyme gets released into the potato when we take the vine away. And the releasing of that invertase enzyme, invertase's job is to get sugar, complex sugar, sucrose, 12 carbon sugar, broken into two reducing sugars the complex sugar sucrose, the 12 carbon sugar, does not fry dark in general. If it's high enough, it can, but in general, it does not fry dark. The simple sugars, glucose and fructose, they're reducing sugars, they fry dark. So, looks great at harvest. Remove the stem, move the plant, the vine. Invertase gets put in. Glucose gets formed. Harvest hangover. You got potatoes that are looking awful rough. You know, we get five days after harvest, and then we wonder when they're going to come back, right? And that's the wondering that some of us are in right now. So then how does that sugar actually get out of the potato? Okay. Well, glucose, the, the right-hand barrel, glucose, is the six-carbon sugar that causes color. Left-hand barrel, sucrose, is the 12-carbon sugar that does not cause color. Again, this is an 88 uh, work by so Keynes and Preston. Interestingly, TechMark kind of came about at the same time this work was published. And for whatever reason, when I was at Michigan State University, I was studying and reading and talking to these two guys about sugars and potatoes and measuring sugars, you know, and started back in 1984. So this potato sugar thing is not new to me. Uh, you know, I had a lot more hair and it was nowhere near as gray when I started looking at these and measuring hundreds and hundreds and thousands of samples of sugar and potatoes, okay? Thankfully, this information was available to me while I was at Michigan State studying. So what happens is 
Again, the starch barrel converts over to the sucrose barrel. So starch on the far left, sucrose coming in. Sucrose, while it does not cause color, is kind of like the barometric pressure of the state of the potato. Okay, and, and it's whenever the sucrose is high, the future state of the potato is not good because in order to get rid of sucrose, you have to use Invertase to break it into glucose and then respire it off. So you can't get rid of sucrose directly. When the plant is active, when it's growing, sucrose can be combined back into starch by a real active pathway. When the plant is no longer growing, sucrose has to move off through glucose. So the question will come, you know, I hold the temperatures warm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can, but the color's not improving. If you monitor sugars, you got to see if the sucrose is dropping. If the sucrose is dropping, your glucose will drop, it's a matter of time. If your sucrose is not dropping or not in an acceptable level, you have a lot longer time to go before the glucose is going to drop. So that question of, I'm doing everything I can, but the color's not improving. The color's the last thing to improve. You have to get a rate of change of the precursors to that color sugar glucose to determine when that glucose is going to start to fall and the processing quality is going to start to increase. So this is our Techmark Sugar Report. Um, some of you, I think most of you have probably seen it before. Pre-harvest information is up above the graphs. There are the individual graphs, which trend lines will go through these. And then there are uh, bend trends and regional performance trends. So we're going to go through this report, kind of break it down this morning. First off, we've got the, the sugar trends, sucrose and glucose. Okay, so we can see um, individual numbers on this chart, and we see some lines on this chart. Let me explain what they are. The individual numbers are the actual sugar readings over time from this bend. So when this bend was harvested, sometime late September, the first sugar sample was taken, we had a 1.253 sucrose with a 125 glucose. It's high glucose. It, as a matter of fact, the highest in the province, as you can see, the green line is an indication of the highest sample measured. The blue line is a weekly indication of the average measured sample, and the red line would be the minimum measured sample, again, by variety and by region. So that's what the lines are. Green is the highest measured, blue is average, red is lowest. So if I own these potatoes on day one, I got one, two, five, three sucrose, one, two, five, point one, two, five glucose, knowing that this is the highest measurement in the province, has value to me. It tells me where I'm at. Now, nobody wants to be there, but whenever you're in trouble and you don't know it, that's a real problem. Now, uh, as we can see, our glucose levels dropped, and by the end of this period, not the end, but say the end of the year, just before the 1st of January, this sample had a 0.076 glucose. That was the lowest glucose so we all want to say, what'd this guy do? Well, let's take a look. This is the quality information. You can see your zeros and ones trending upward as we move from left to right. You can see your number twos kind of stable or trending downward. And you can see your threes and fours uh, were higher at the beginning. Uh, there was a little blip there mid set, and now um, we've got zero threes and fours. So again, just to remind you what you're looking at is quality information. You know the rating scale, zeros and ones, twos, threes and fours. And then the green would be the max, the blue average, and the red minimal. Here's our temperatures. And interestingly enough, we saw a preconditioning strategy used in this storage. It was held above 54 degrees. Um, actually, that last sample had already gotten down to around 49, one of the cooler ones in, in the province. But if you look at it, this storage was held at the top end of the average for the temperatures uh, in the province, um, right up until um, the first part, say the 5th of November, and then the temperature started to drop. So it wasn't cooled early, it was held warm, and the sugar profile reflects that. This is an individual comparison for this, Ben. So we see on the 30th of November what the sugar Sucrose wasn't, it's not for this bin, obviously, because this is a 585 and a 563. 
This is from a different band of potatoes. Uh, we wanted to kind of pull those apart and didn't want to give specific numbers out. Um, and then this is uh, to give you a feel for where the blue line, the red line, and the green line come from. So on the right-hand side of that report, um, this is the eight sample. So you see that N equals eight. This is not a large data pool. We need to increase the size of this pool so that we can get uh, better predictability. But this is where we're at right now with our province averages for these eight samples. These are a picture of the fries, um, individual dates. And again, this is all available um, to the grower that, used, that, that did this work. Um, so again, that's the Techmark sugar report. We're going to talk about specifics around that sugar report. We're going to talk about specific examples with varieties now, and then we'll open up for questions again. So this is a sugar report for what I will call an, an immature uh, in late August high sucrose coming out of the field challenge. How do we know that? Here's our pre-harvest samples. We're at 356. And our gravity is really not where we want it either, which it's nice that the gravity is there. It feels comfortable that, hey, we got high sugar and low gravity. That makes sense. That's not always the case, though. This specific one, we're pretty sure about immaturity because both indicators that we might use are both telling us we could be in an issue. Um, so what do we have happening? Um, you know, we've got a fair amount of, of uh, the twos and threes. We've got, you know, this, this slight upward trend of twos that's possibly the, the threes and fours coming up into this and you know we've just got this this kind of sagging nothing predictable on the zeros and ones this isn't the way we want things to go obviously we're right up near the top of this um sugar pool right through the entire set we haven't got them cleared down um probably started cooling a bit early with this one this immaturity is an indicator that we really have to make sure that sugar's out of there. And again, preconditioning um, for, let's say, frozen or potatoes that saw frost in the field, bad, bad call. Uh, preconditioning for immature potatoes, good call. So you have to determine whether your challenge was from uh, frost or from maturity. That's why you have to pre-harvest sample before frost, okay? So we knew that these potatoes were immature um the jury's still out these are still in the bin so um that's something that's out there something that's got to be processed that's a russet burbank um umatilla russet <clears throat> i know you saw the uh the samples on umatilla uh, a lot of of higher sugar samples these temperatures were dropped pretty quickly um and we really we picked the temperature back up as you can see they were down to 48 we saw this, we were, you know, we're coming down on sucrose and all of a sudden we saw this horizontal move, called and talked, uh, yeah, we, we cooled them, okay, let's bring them back up a little bit so get this sugar cleared out some. Okay, so so we start to drop out. Realize, where's the green line? The green line somewhere is up here. This is 2.5, so this is not the highest sugar of these umatillas, but this is nearer the average. Still, we picked up the temperature to 50, and you can see we're clearing down sucrose, beginning to clear down glucose, and we'll start to see an increase in quality of this pro product as we move uh, and clear these sugars out. Again, the sucrose is our predictor of where we're headed. When we saw this flat line, we saw this temperature drop, we knew they were hooked together, and we said, let's, let's get that temperature back up and get that sucrose coming down again. So that's a umatilla. Ranger, um, high glucose, um, significant challenge in storage process quality, and we're talking sub 50% zeros and ones, uh, through keeping the temperatures warm. You know, we've pretty much taken these threes and fours and pushed them up, and we're going to start pushing those north into the zeros and ones. So again, a crop that's moving in the right direction. But one where through this whole process here, you're hearing that comment, man, you know, we're holding these warm, but nothing's happening. Well, something is happening. We went from a 1-3 sucrose to a 7-6-5 sucrose. We can't see that. We can't see it through process color. The only way you can see it is through sucrose. 
we see it in the sucrose, that shoe is going to drop in six to eight more weeks. So it's one of those deals where you need to process a crop according to when it's at its best. One of the challenges you face if you don't have the predictors in place is you might use a crop before it's at its best, or you might delay when a crop is at its best and miss it. So it's very important if you're going to manage a large inventory of potatoes to have this information so that you can use it to its maximum profit potential. Clean waters we talked about earlier, aren't they beautiful? I mean, they're just pretty and low sugars. Um, I just put this up here just because they're, they're at, you know, cold temperatures, 40, 49, now 46, 4, and they just are processing 100% zeros and ones, and they look nice. So that's individual um, sugar, storage sugar information. Again, I'm going to break out of presentation now, move back over into some question and answer mode, and just ask is, uh, you know, has anybody got anything they really want to talk about with me or the group? before we move on. Don't all ask at once. And remember, you have to unmute yourself to ask. All right. I am going to move on to presenting then. All right, we did this study last year with some folks and we're doing, we've are doing. we done some uh, with people before. Uh, we've got some going on right now. So does the fry, fry color recover to acceptable level in something called the rate of recovery test? So what is a rate of recovery test? Uh, take 200 pounds of potatoes. You take them and warm them up to over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. We like them at 70 Fahrenheit. We allow them to recover and we measure them both at current temperature, whatever that is, 48 degrees I'm saying in this study, and then at warm temperatures. And we see the rate of change, so we're watching the rate of change of sucrose first to see how that sucrose pool is being pulled down by this higher respiration rate. And we watch glucose and process quality. So that's going to give us a feel for, it's like the doctor putting us on a treadmill, okay? It's like a stress test. We increase respiration quickly when we increase temperature quickly from 48 to 70. It's, it's a step in respiration. That's going to absorb some of the free sugar that's out there in that tuber. It's also going to increase the consumption of sugar rate because respiration increases, so we're using more sugar per minute. And that potato is going to start to remove the sugar. We're not advocating and wouldn't advocate warming the storage to this temperature. That's not what the study's about. The study is to try and get a feel for what this potential of this crop is, what's its best potential. And then should we warm, shouldn't we warm, how much should we warm, and when should we warm this crop to try and hit that potential we see in this rate of recovery test. So I like to close these presentations with a statement of a guy that uh, passed away in 1985, <clears throat> fortunate enough to walk into his office in the fall of 1983, at the time as a 17 year old, just looking for work and uh, got the potato bug in the fall of 1983. And I ate a lot of them before then, but I started studying them in the fall of 83. And I imagine that I'll be studying them until I uh, joined Dr. Cargill. So he passed away in 1985. Thanks for uh, your interest. Thanks both to uh, Jamie and his crew and Darren and his crew, Darren and Deb and their crew, for uh, all the information we use to put this together. We're gonna open it up again for some more uh, general comments and questions. So I'll move back over into presenter mode.